Welcome. This is session number five. Okay, session number five. Here we go. We've already discussed quite a bit of stuff, but this session we want to talk about facts or faith. We've already covered quite a bit of material. In session number one, we said both creation and evolution are what? Religion. They're both religions. That's exactly right. Session number two, we said the earth is not old. The earth is the earth is very young. Hey, you remember in session three when God originally made the world, he said it was good. When God originally made it, it was very, very good. And then last session, session number four, we said dinosaurs didn't live millions of years ago. They've always lived with man. Yes, they've always lived with man. Now we want to talk about fact versus faith. Now, I don't want to scare you guys. I know I've got a lot of textbooks up here, and uh, it's because I like science. We actually collect science textbooks. So this is just a little bit of our collection of the science textbooks that we collect. Yes, we are geeks. Thank you very much. But uh, I want you to look at this next picture, and I want you to tell me what you see. You guys at home, pay attention, and tell me what you see here. Okay, what do you see right there? How many of you see an old woman? How many of you see a young woman? Both. How many of you see both? Oh, kind of confusing there. Just try this one out. What is this? First one to tell me what it is wins a special prize. Old people. Old people. Are you sure? It's not two Mexicans? It might be two Mexicans, one playing a guitar. See that? Which one is that? Oh. It all depends on your perspective, doesn't it? It all depends on the perspective there. How about this? Are the stairs right side up or are they upside down? What do you guys think? Right side up or upside down? It all depends on your perspective, doesn't it? How about this one? What do you see there? How many of you see a bunny? How many of you see a duck? How many of you see both of them? <laughs> you know, it really all depends on our perspective to tell us exactly what we're going to see. You know, we love science. We, we really do. I got a D plus in school in science, so uh, did really well there. And we really do enjoy science. However, we've discovered that a lot of faith has actually crept into the science books. And we don't want religion in the schools, do we? So we got to get faith out of the science books. Take a look at this. This is a picture of the Grand Canyon. Cool. Well, there's no question the Grand Canyon is a big old giant hole in the ground. But i got a question for you. How did the Grand Canyon actually get there? This textbook says, Over millions of years, the Colorado River has carved out the Grand Canyon from solid rock. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. we got to think about this for a second. Now, it is a fact that the Grand Canyon does exist. Is anybody going to argue with that fact? No, the Grand Canyon is a big old hole in the ground, but how did it get there? Now we've got an evolutionist interpretation and a creationist interpretation. The evolutionist says, oh, it forms slowly with a little bit of water and lots and lots of time. The creationist says, no, it formed quickly with a lot of water and a little bit of time. Here we have a fact and two different interpretations of the fact. The problem is, many times evolutionists tie their faith-based interpretation of the fact to the actual fact. I'll give you another example. The earth today has layers of, layers of sedimentary rock. Nobody's going to argue with that. But how did those layers get there? The evolutionist says they form slowly over millions of years. Creationists say they were laid down very quickly during Noah's flood. So which one is true? Now here's what you got to watch for, okay? Evolutionists are always trying to erase the line between the fact and the interpretation of the fact. They actually want to try to make it seem like their interpretation of the fact is actually part of the actual fact. When, in fact... It is not. Okay, so that's what you got to watch for. And so we're going to be doing some watching. Let, let's look at this line right here in this textbook. The Colorado River has 
carved through, is cut through layer upon layer of rock over millions of years. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, is that a fact? Or is that an interpretation of the fact? Is that a faith-based statement there? That's a faith-based statement. We actually did a creation minute on the Grand Canyon. This is really cool. Check this out. Welcome to Creation Minute. I'm Eric Hoven. Ah, the Grand Canyon. 277 miles long, 10 to 18 miles wide, and more than a mile deep. That's impressive. In the bottom is the Colorado River. You know, some scientists suggest the Colorado River formed the Grand Canyon over millions of years. But take a look at these facts to see it from a different perspective. The Colorado River exits the canyon 1,800 feet above sea level. It enters the canyon 2,800 feet above sea level. And the top of Grand Canyon is 7,000 feet above sea level. So you tell me, did the river flow uphill for millions of years to carve out the Grand Canyon? Or is it possible that the Grand Canyon is the result of Noah's flood? To learn more about creation, visit us at creationminute.com. Did the Colorado River form the Grand Canyon? No, it didn't. There's a couple points you need to see about the Grand Canyon. Number one, you need to remember that the top of Grand Canyon is higher than the bottom. How many of you guys knew that already? Okay, you got that part figured out? Okay. Second thing you need to keep in mind is that the river runs through the bottom. You guys got that figured out with no help? All right. Another thing you need to think about is the fact that the top of Grand Canyon is higher than where the river enters the canyon by 4,000 feet. Um, rivers, they don't flow uphill. That river did not make that canyon. It's impossible. The, the Colorado River could not have formed Grand Canyon. So here they say that the Colorado River formed Grand Canyon. It cut through layer upon layer of rock over millions of years. Is that a fact or is that a faith-based statement? It's faith-based, isn't it? And we don't want faith-based statements in the book, do we? So we're going to have to take that out. We certainly don't want that in our textbook. Okay, let's go to another one here because that is definitely based on faith. What about the geologic column? You guys ever heard of the geologic column before? You got all these layers of sediment, the, the Cretaceous and the Jurassic, for Jurassic Park named after the Jurassic layer. And you got all these different layers to the rock. Hey, are they really different ages? See, it was back during the early 1800s that each layer of rock was given a name, an age, and an index fossil. They said they knew how old the layer was way before carbon dating ever came around. Back in the 1800s, they went ahead and gave it uh, an age, how old they thought that it was. Now, you got to understand the geologic column is the Bible for the evolutionists, okay? And it can only be found one place in the entire world. One place in the whole world you can find the geologic column. Guess where it's at? Right here in the textbooks. That is the only place in the entire world you can find the geologic column. It doesn't exist anywhere. This textbook admits it. If there were a column of sediments, unfortunately no such column exists, they admit we don't have the evidence. You, you really don't have anything called a geologic column. If it did exist in one place, it would be 100 miles thick. Wow. So the geologic column, is that fact or is that faith? faith? It's faith. And we don't want faith in the textbooks, do we? No. So what do we need to do? We need to take that out of there, don't we? We do not want faith in the textbooks. How about this? There are layers to the earth. Nobody's going to question that. But are the layers different ages? If each layer was laid down slowly over millions of years, wouldn't you expect to see some erosion marks in between the layers? But we don't. All we see is nice, smooth layers that have been laid down. They tell us these, these um, layers are all different ages. You got 100 million, 200 million, 300 million, 400 million years old. Problem, they have found polystrata fossils. Fossils of trees running up through the different layers. Well, if you got a tree that's running up through all your different layers, well, could they be millions of years different in age? No, they couldn't. Here's a petrified tree standing straight up out of the ground at Yellowstone National Park. 
You ever seen one of them trees growing, the petrified kind? They're actually made out of stone. They grow right up out of the ground. Yeah. <laughs> no, that doesn't happen, does it? These polystrata fossils show us that those layers are not different ages. Sometimes, get this, they even find the trees upside down running through those different layers. How many of you have seen one of those trees growing outside? The upside down tree, the roots are up, you got to dig for the apple? They're crazy, man. <laughs> How do you explain this? Well, a worldwide flood would explain that. No problem. But those layers are not different ages. You're welcome to say, and they tell us, oh, those layers are different ages. But is that based on fact or is that based on faith? faith. faith. That's based on faith. And we don't want faith in the textbook, do we? No. So what do we need to do? We need to take that out of the textbook because we don't want that in our textbook, do we? No way. Check this out. If you ask an evolutionist, hey, how do you tell how old that layer of rock is? He'll say, that's a great question. We can tell the, la the age of the layer of rock based on what fossils are found in it. They actually say that in here. We know the age of the layer based on the fossils. Then if you say, well, hang on, how do you know the age of the fossil? They say, oh, we know the age of the fossil based on what rock layer it's found in. Wait a minute. You know the age of the layer based on the fossil, and you know the age of the fossil based on the layer. Isn't that just simply circular reasoning? That's all it is. Here it is in the textbook. Page 306, they date the rock by the fossil. Page 307, they date the fossil by the rock. They tell us they know how old these things are. Is that based on fact or is that based on faith? faith. That's faith. We don't want faith in the textbook, do we? So what do we need to do? We need to take that out of there. Yeah, we don't need faith in our textbooks, all right? How about this one? They say dinosaurs lived 70 million years ago. Well, you're welcome to believe that. But is that a fact or is that based on faith? faith. That is definitely based on faith. Let me get there. There's my dinosaur right there. Next page. We don't want faith in the textbook, do we? No, so what do we need to do about dinosaurs being millions of years old? We need to take that out of there, yeah. We don't want faith in the textbooks, because, man, they really don't want that. Come on, they have found dinosaur bone with fresh blood inside. The dinosaurs did not live millions of years ago. They have found dinosaur bones that are not even petrified. They haven't turned to stone. Whoa! Whoa! And you want me to believe that it's 70 million years old? Now we've got a problem, okay? I don't believe they are millions of years old. It's interesting. A couple years ago when they found these fresh dinosaur bones and they were not fossilized, they never, ever questioned how old the bones might be and said, ah, oh, well, maybe the dinosaurs didn't live millions of years ago. That thought never crossed their mind. Instead, they said, ah, oh, I wonder if that means that fossilization takes a lot longer than we thought. <laughs> they missed the whole point. No, the point is dinosaurs didn't live millions of years ago. Now, Charles Darwin, who we give credit for coming up with the idea of evolution, even though he kind of stole it from his grandpa, but anyway, he, we give him credit for coming up with this idea of evolution. When he was out of Bible college... Yes, that's right. He went to school to be a preacher. But anyway, uh, he got out of Bible college and he set sail on the HMS Beagle. Went around the world for five years. One of the places that he stopped on his trip around the world was the Galapagos Islands. When he stopped there on the Galapagos Islands, Charles Darwin found that there were a variety of finches on that island. He counted 14 different varieties of finches on that island. And Charlie had a thought. He said, you know... I'll bet you all those finches had a common ancestor. I'll bet he was right. I can even tell you what it was. A uh, finch. <laughs> but Charlie came up with a different idea. He said, maybe the finch and the eagle are related. <gasps> maybe the finch, the eagle, and the earthworm are related. <laughs> maybe the finch, the eagle, the earthworm and the trees are related. Maybe I'm related to the finch. Whoa! Later on in his book, The Origin of Species, he says, It is a truly wonderful fact that all animals and all plants throughout all time and space should be related to each other. Whoa, 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 whoa! Is that a fact or is that based on faith? 
that is definitely a faith statement. There is no evidence that man and, or, and, and uh, plants or animals and plants are related. There's no evidence of that whatsoever. So we don't want faith in the textbooks, do we? No way. Now, so what should we do with that? We need to take that out of the textbooks because we certainly do not want faith in our textbooks. I mean, we got to be above reproach here, okay? Now, Charles Darwin observed what is called microevolution. Micro means... <laughs> come on now. Micro means... Yeah, micro means small. So Charles Darwin observed microevolution. We looked at that in session number one. But then he jumped to the conclusion, well, maybe everything's related. He saw dogs producing a variety of dogs, roses producing a variety of roses, and he thought maybe they're all related. And its common ancestor was a rock. <laughs> oh, come on. Hey, here's how they define evolution in the textbooks. I love this. They confuse the kids as much as they can. Definition number one, evolution is change over time. Is that really what they mean? Later on it says definition number two, oh no, evolution is a change in living things over time. Well, hold on. Now you're down to just the last two stages of evolution. You remember the six types of evolution that we covered? Cosmic evolution, chemical evolution, stellar and planetary evolution, organic evolution. They didn't mention those in there, did they? If it's just the change in living, uh, change in living things over time. Then definition number three. Evolution can be defined as a change in species over time. Well, now you're down to what I believe. Sure, microevolution takes place, and there's lots and lots of evidence of that. But they say evolution is just change over time. Is that fact, or is that faith? faith. It's more faith in the textbooks. What are we going to do about this, guys? We need to take it out. Yeah, let's get rid of that, because we don't want faith in the textbooks. Okay, so we got all this faith in the textbooks. Here's the problem. The real meaning of evolution kind of gets slipped in under the door as kids continue to be, quote, educated. And if a kid objects to evolution teaching and says, I don't believe that's true, well, then they're kind of ridiculed. They're told, ah, oh, you just don't understand science. That's your problem. When really I think it's that we do have a grasp of reality. They say variations cause evolution. Do variations actually cause evolution? Here it is in a textbook. They say, look at this divergent evolution. And it's showing a variety of different dogs. Well, you're welcome to call that divergent evolution. But giving it a fancy name doesn't change the facts. It's still a dog, isn't it? And that's not really evolution. Variations do happen. There's no question about it. There's a variety of cows in the world, variety of horses in the world, variety of dogs in the world, variety of cats in the world. Variations happen. However, they don't cause evolution. Now, this book teaches that variations actually cause evolution. There we go. Variations actually cause evolution. Is that based on faith or is that a fact? That's a faith-based statement, isn't it? And we don't want faith in the textbooks, do we? What do we need to do with this? We need to take that out of the textbook because that has nothing whatsoever to do with real science, okay? Now, evolution is based on two faulty assumptions. First of all, evolution, according to evolution, they say, well, mutations change things. And then natural selection causes this change to take over the whole population. Nothing could be further from the truth. Now, do mutations happen? Yes. Here's a mutated bull. It's a bull with five legs. It's got an extra leg growing out of its back. It's mutated. But is that a beneficial mutation? Does that help out the bull at all? Can he run any faster with that extra leg? No, it ain't helping the bull at all. So, it's not a beneficial mutation. It doesn't help anything. Here's a short-legged sheep. It's a mutation, but it's not a beneficial mutation. Why? When the wolf comes running after him, he's the first one that's going to get caught, man, because he can't run fast enough. The wolf is going to come and the sheep are going to take off running. They're going to look back and say, Aw, Herman didn't make it. <laughs> Well, he can't run fast enough. Of course he's not going to make it. Here's a mutated turtle. He's mutant, but not ninja, okay? We got a mutated turtle. 
They say beneficial mutations cause evolution. The problem is there are no beneficial mutations. Check out this textbook. It says, boys and girls, normal fruit flies have two wings. This mutant has four. This rare mutations, like most, is harmful. Then it says, beneficial mutations are the material for natural selection. Well, then why didn't they give us a, show us an example of a beneficial mutation? Because there aren't any. Now, they teach the kids in the books that benef beneficial mutations actually cause evolution. Is that a fact or is that a faith-based statement? That's a faith-based statement. We don't want faith in the textbooks, do we? So what should we do about that? We need to take that out of there, yeah, because we certainly don't want faith mixed in our science textbooks, okay? They say natural selection causes evolution. No, 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 no. Natural selection can't cause anything to happen. Natural selection can only act on the biologic properties that already exist. It can't create something brand new. Natural selection isn't some magical, mystical creator that can make something brand new for us. Now, they tell us natural selection causes evolution. Is that a fact? Or is that what they believe? Is that a faith-based statement? That's a faith-based statement. We don't want that in our books, do we? So what do we need to do about that? We need to take that one out of the books, don't we? You kids are liking this, aren't you? Ripping up the textbooks. Don't do that with yours because you've got to pay for it, okay? Um, it's definitely a faith-based statement. Hey, you guys ever get these? They tell the kids, think critically. Yes, boys and girls, think critically. Um, do you think that humans are still evolving? What kind of a question is that? That's not telling the kids to think critically. That's like me saying, hey, have you stopped beating your wife yet? <laughs> think critically. <laughs> the question assumes something, doesn't it? And today in the textbooks, they are doing a great job of telling the kids what to think and deceiving the kids rather than teaching them how to think. In the evolution, in the evolution chapter uh, in the textbooks, they say we've got evidence of evolution from structure called comparative anatomy. Some of you guys have probably already learned this. Comparative anatomy proves evolution. Here's what they do for the kids. They show them a whole bunch of pictures of different animals and their forelimbs and show how their forelimbs are very similar to each other. They say, boys and girls, there it is. Boys and girls, a human has two wrists in his forearm, a radius and an ulna. Boys and girls, the cat has two bones in his forearm. Guess what they're called? Radius and ulna. Boys and girls, the whale has got two uh, bones in his forearm of the forearm of his flipper. Guess what they're called? Radius and ulna. Are you catching on? They had a common ancestor. They all evolved from the same thing. Wait a minute. Couldn't that be evidence of a common designer? Wouldn't that make a little bit more sense than a common ancestor? Hey, did you know that both Ford and General Motors put four wheels on most of their vehicles? <laughs> Guess what they call them? Oh. Tires. <laughs> that proves they evolved from a skateboard 20 million years ago. It's obvious evidence right there. <laughs> It doesn't make sense, does it? Comparative anatomy is evidence of design, not evidence of evolution. Now, you're welcome to say in the books, comparative anatomy provides further evidence of evolution. But is that a fact or is that faith? faith. That's faith-based. We don't want that in the textbook, do we? So we better make sure and get rid of that one, all right? They also say we have evidence from development. Whoa. Evidence from development? Yeah, they say the human embryo, when it's inside the mother, goes through the stages of evolution. Starts off as a fish, then amphibian, then reptile, then mammal. F-A-R-M, farm. Fish, amphibian, reptile, mammal. That way you can remember it for the quiz, okay? So they say the human embryo inside the mother goes through those stages. No, I don't think so. You know, Darwin said that the similarity 
in the early stages of development of the different embryos of, you know, dog, cats, uh, horses, all these different things, humans. He said this was great evidence that we shared a common ancestor. Evolution. He later said this was his strongest single class of evidence in favor of his theory. Whoa. Let me give you the truth on this one. Ernst Haeckel is the guy who came up with embryology. His, he said his turning point in thinking was when he read Charles Darwin's book, The Origin of Species. Interesting. Well, Darwin in his book said, if evolution is true, there'll be lots of evidence. Well, 10 years later, they hadn't exactly found any. So Haeckel decided to help him out a little bit. And he made up some evidence. He took a dog embryo at four weeks and a human embryo at four weeks and drew them to look exactly alike. He faked the drawings. Wow. He did this with several different animals, faked the drawings of what they really look like. He then went around, traveled around, and converted a lot of people to believing in evolution because of his fake drawings. Wow. Guess what? A few years later, in 1874, he was convicted of fraud at his own university. Yeah. However, guess what is still in textbooks, in some textbooks, not all, but in some textbooks today? His fake drawings. They are still in some textbooks today as evidence of evolution. Whoa! Check out this textbook. It says, By seven months, the fetus from the outside looks like a tiny, normal baby. But it is not. Wait a minute. Not a baby at seven months? Uh, my brother was born at seven months. You want to step up and talk to me about how he's not a baby? Come on. <laughs> That's what they're telling him. This textbook says the human embryo has gills like a fish. Whoa, 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 gills like a fish? That's not true. That, actually, those are folds of skin that later develop into be parts of the ear and parts of the throat. They have nothing whatsoever to do with evolution. Nothing to do with evolution. Now, you're welcome to believe that embryology is evidence of evolution. However, is that a fact or is that a faith-based statement? That's a faith-based statement. What are we going to do about that? We need to take it out, don't we? We do not want that embryology junk in there because it is not evidence of evolution. Now, let me tell you how they're kind of tricking us up here. They're actually taking that out of the student editions in some places and just talking about it just a little bit, not showing the pictures. But then they're putting it on CD-ROMs and in the teacher's edition so the teacher can show it to the kids. That way it's not officially in the textbooks, but the teacher can still teach that lie of embryology, okay? And it's a faith, it's a faith-based statement. That's all there is to it, okay? Now, why do they keep this lie in the textbooks? Very simple. That's the only scientific way to justify an abortion. To say it's not human yet. I'm sorry. It's human from con conception. That's when it becomes a human, okay? Right there at conception, Abortion is just plain murder. And they keep that lie in these books so that they can scientifically justify having an abortion. Oh, it's just in the fish stage. Don't worry about it. It's not really a human. We're not really killing a human. Wow. The Bible says, Cursed be he that taketh reward to slay an innocent person. And all the people shall say... Amen. That's exactly right. These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and... Hands that shed innocent blood. Let me tell you something. Judgment Day is coming soon for those people, I guarantee you. Okay, it's going to happen. What about vestigial structures? Are those evidence of evolution? This textbook tells the kids, boys and girls, the humans have an appendix that is no longer necessary. It's vestigial. And that's evidence of evolution. Is that really evidence of evolution? I mean, the idea that you used to need something and you don't need it anymore... No, that would be the opposite of evolution. That's losing something, not gaining something. So vestigial structures do not prove evolution. That's not fact, is it? No. That's faith-based, isn't it? And we don't want faith in the textbook, so of course we need to tear that one out. There are no vestigial organs, okay? Even if there were vestigial organs, that's the opposite of evolution. That's not helping evolution out. Check this out. They say the whale has a vestigial pelvis and femur. 
from when it used to walk around on land. What? Yeah, the whale has a vestigial pelvis and femur. Check this textbook out. Just imagine whales walking around. It's true. <laughs> imagine the whale walking around on land. Okay, here's what they're talking about. The vestigial pelvis and femur on a whale. Now, we happen to have in our museum a whale vertebrae. I brought it here with me. A whale vertebrae. This is one of the vertebrae out of the back of a whale. He didn't need it anymore, so uh, we took it from him. This is one of those bones that they're referring to. Let me grab this. Ah, there's the bone. Yes, boys and girls, just imagine whales walking around. <laughs> I'm having a hard time imagining that, okay? Whales walking around, yeah. I don't think that represents reality. Oop, let me knock that over. According to evolution, it should have stood up by itself, but it didn't. That's weird. Uh, uh. Can you imagine whales walking around? No, no, no. That is not a fact statement. Matter of fact, those bones in the whale have nothing to do with walking around on land. Those bones are actually where some muscles attach to so that, well, so that the whales can... Um, uh, reproduce. <laughs> it helps them do that, okay? So those bones have nothing to do with walking around on land. It has to do with making more baby whales. That's not evidence of evolution. Now you're welcome to teach the kids that the whale, pelvis, and femur is a vestigial structure from when they walked around on land. But is that real science? Is that a fact? Or is that just an interpretation of the fact based on faith? That's a faith-based statement, isn't it? And we certainly don't want faith-based statements in our textbooks. Hey, also in the textbooks, they are doing lots and lots of these now called um, cladograms, where they show the kids all the different things, and then they got the lines connecting them. All these cladograms are in the books just to try to help kids believe in evolution. The lines represent nothing except what's going on in the imagination of their mind. Here's the typical tree of life in the textbooks. Yes, boys and girls, we all had a common ancestor. Great, 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 grandpa bacteria. Yes, there he is right there. And then slowly over billions of years, humans formed out of that. And they got all these, the, these lines connecting these different images. They got cladograms all throughout the textbooks trying to show and trying to get the kids to believe in evolution. But... Is that a fact-based statement or, or, or image, or is that a faith-based image? Faith. It's faith-based, isn't it? We don't want that in the textbooks, do we? And they actually go all through the textbooks and do that. You say, Eric, what's the point? Okay, so we got a lot of faith in here. By the way, I want you to notice, if you were to take all the faith-based statements out, you still have a lot of good science left, don't you? People say, you can't take evolution out of the science books. Evolution is the foundation for science. No, it's not. Evolution has nothing to do with science. It's a faith-based religion that has crept its way into the science textbooks. But it has nothing whatsoever to do with science. And evolution is a dangerous religion. It has led people to do some unbelievable things. Because according to evolution, there is no right, there is no wrong, there are no moral absolutes. You can do whatever you want to, according to evolution. And the truth is, Satan is using the idea of evolution to deceive people about what God's Word says. And he's using evolution to send people straight to hell. That's a problem. I don't know if you realize this, 75% of kids who grow up in a Christian home, attend public school, and then a public university, after one year in college, 75% of them or reject their faith in Christianity. We're losing 75%. It's not because of the good science. It's because of the lies that have been mixed in there with them. It's because of the faith that goes in there that gets kids to believe in the faith, the religion of evolution, rather than real science. So, is evolution based on facts, or is it based on faith? faith? It's based on faith. That's exactly right. Hey, thank you for joining me. We'll see you for session six. God bless. And we really do enjoy science. However, we've discovered that a lot of faith has actually crept into the science books. And we don't want religion in the schools, do we? So we've got to get faith out of the science books. Take a look at this. 
This is a picture of the Grand Canyon. Cool. Well, there's no question the Grand Canyon is a big old giant hole in the ground, but I got a question for you. How did the Grand Canyon actually get there? This textbook says over millions of years, the Colorado River has carved out the Grand Canyon from solid rock. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. We got to think about this for a second. Now, it is a fact that the Grand Canyon does exist. Is anybody going to argue with that fact? No, the Grand Canyon is a big old hole in the ground, but how did it get there? Now we've got an evolutionist interpretation and a creationist interpretation. The evolutionist says, oh, it forms slowly. Are you sure? It's not two Mexicans? It might be two Mexicans, one playing a guitar. See that? Which one is that? Ah, it all depends on your perspective, doesn't it? It all depends on the perspective there. How about this? Are the stairs right side up or are they upside down? What do you guys think? Right side up or upside down? It all depends on your perspective, doesn't it? How about this one? What do you see there? How many of you see a bunny? How many of you see a duck? How many of you see both of them? <laughs> you know, it really all depends on our perspective to tell us exactly what we're going to see. You know, we love science. We, we really do. I got a D plus in school in science, so uh, did really well there. With a little bit of water and lots and lots of time. The creationist says, no, it formed quickly with a lot of water and a little bit of time. Here we have a fact and two different interpretations of the fact. The problem is, many times evolutionists tie their faith-based interpretation of the fact to the actual fact. Give you another example. The earth today has layers of, layers of sedimentary rock. Nobody's going to argue with that. But how did those layers get there? The evolutionist says they formed slowly over millions of years. Creationists say they were laid down very quickly during Noah's flood. So which one is true? Now here's what you got to watch for, okay? Evolutionists are always trying to erase the line between the fact and the interpretation of the fact. They actually want to try to make it seem like their interpretation of the fact is actually part of the actual fact. Welcome. This is session number five. Okay, session number five. Here we go. We've already discussed quite a bit of stuff, but this session we want to talk about facts or faith. We've already covered quite a bit of material. In session number one, we said both creation and evolution are what? Religion. They're both religions. That's exactly right. Session number two, we said the earth is not old. The earth is... The earth is very young. Hey, you remember in session three when God originally made the world, he said it was good. When God originally made it, it was very, very good. And then last session, session number four, we said dinosaurs didn't live millions of years ago. They've always lived with man. Yes, they've always lived with man. Now we want to talk about facts versus faith. Now, I don't want to scare you guys. I know i got a lot of textbooks up here, and uh, it's because I like science. We actually collect science textbooks. So this is just a little bit of our collection of the science textbooks that we collect. Yes, we are geeks. Thank you very much. But uh, I want you to look at this next picture, and I want you to tell me what you see. You guys at home, pay attention, and tell me what you see here, okay? What do you see right there? How many of you see an old woman? How many of you see a young woman? Both. How many of you see both? Oh, kind of confusing there. Just try this one out. What is this? First one to tell me what it is wins a special prize. Old people. Old people. 